advised. This is 10 Minute Murder. It's the 1970s, and we're in Staten Island. Islanders have embraced that 70s laid-back lifestyle, and children are given lots of freedom. They roam the streets freely, running errands or playing until the streetlights come on. Fast forward 10 years later, children are scared to leave their yards, and parents anxiously scan the newspaper for any new disappearances. So what's changed? The emergence of a peculiar and disturbing man by the name of Andre Rand. Andre Rand was born Frank Russian on March 11, 1944 in Manhattan, New York. He had a relatively peaceful childhood until 14 when his father died and shortly after his mother was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. As he grew older, he began committing petty crimes and those around him would describe him as getting increasingly peculiar. However, our story doesn't begin with Andre Rand, but instead with the story of Cropsy. Cropsy was an urban legend about an escaped mental patient who hunted children, taking them into tunnels of abandoned buildings to kill them. The story was originally told around campfires or by older siblings just having some fun, but it soon took on a new use. Parents began telling it as a cautionary tale against exploring a specific building, Willowbrook State School. And parents had good reasons for this. Willowbrook State School was not a school, but a horrifying mental asylum. To give you an idea of what Willowbrook was like, in 1965, Senator Robert F. Kennedy visited Willowbrook and described residents as living in filth and dirt, their clothing in rags. And he described the rooms as, quote, less comfortable and cheerful than the cages in which we put animals in a zoo. And honestly, that might have been a generous description because this place was awful, like the stuff of nightmares. The school was extremely understaffed, with about 50 residents for every one Willowbrook attendant, and overcrowded, leading to frequent outbreaks of diseases such as hepatitis. Though Kennedy made some suggestions to improve conditions, little changed until 1972 when ABC reporter Geraldo Rivera made headlines with a TV expose on Willowbrook's abuse. That expose is available on YouTube, and the footage is truly chilling, but worth watching. Anyway, the expose led to a national outcry and, understandably, a few lawsuits. Willowbrook was promptly closed. Before we go on, it's important to note that Willowbrook was built across 375 acres of land, so the buildings were all connected by a walkable underground tunnel, or tunnels, for the staff to get around in the winter. When Willowbrook closed, most of its residents were released into group homes or went to live with their families, but some were left to basically fend for themselves. There are reports of former residents camping in the nearby woods of Willowbrook and even occupying the tunnels themselves. The story of Cropsy evolved to an escaped Willowbrook patient killing his victims in Willowbrook's underground tunnels. And now that it involved a real place, the legend of Cropsy caught fire. So Willowbrook shuts down, and its grounds are admittedly a bit creepy, but everyone lives happily ever after, right? Well, there's a bit more to the story than that. When Willowbrook was open, they clearly did not do a very thorough background check, because from 1966 to 1968, they employed an orderly who went by the name of Bruchette. Bruchette was simply Frank Russian's alias. When Willowbrook closed, Frank became unemployed. But instead of scrolling through Craigslist, because that didn't exist, he found a different, more sinister way to occupy his time. In May of 1969, a passing police car noticed a suspicious-looking van in a vacant lot. Upon investigating, they discovered a naked Frank and a nine-year-old girl. Frank was arrested and charged with attempted rape, serving 16 months in jail. Upon release, Frank legally changed his name to Andre Rand, and I don't know about you, but if I'm a Staten Island judge and an ex-convict slash sex offender who's operated under aliases in the past petitions me to change his name, I'd probably say no. But that's not how it went down, because in 1972, Frank Russian legally became Andre Rand. 
And this new Andre Rand was not the reformed man that he clearly convinced the courts that he would become. On July 7th, 1972, 3.30 p.m., Alice Piera was playing with her brother in the lobby of their apartment building. Her brother left her alone for about a minute, and when he returned, she was gone. Andre Rand was working as a painter in that very building and was brought in for questioning, but released because of a lack of evidence connecting him to Alice's disappearance. Alice was five when she disappeared and has never been found. And the disappearances only continued. On a summer day in 1981, seven-year-old Holly Ann Hughes was sent to the store to buy a bar of soap. Storekeepers at the Port Richmond Deli confirmed that Holly bought the soap, but she never made it home. In investigating her disappearance, police discovered that she had been seen talking to Andre Rand outside the shop. They brought Andre in for questioning, and he admitted to talking to Holly, even that he played hide-and-seek with her. Other witnesses reported seeing Andre's green Volkswagen circling the deli that Holly disappeared from. Once again, authorities didn't have enough evidence to hold him, so Andre was released. Despite many searches, Holly has never been found. Okay, so far we have two disappearances that Andre Rand seemed suspiciously connected to, but maybe he was just really in the wrong place at the wrong time. Eh, but probably not when you hear what he got up to in 1983. Just two years after Holly's disappearance, Andre drove a large van into a Staten Island YMCA. Andre convinced 11 children to get into the van, claiming that he would drive them to a park. He then drove them to the Newark State Airport, where he bought them all White Castle burgers. Why he did this is truly a mystery. He claimed he only wanted to take the kids on a fun excursion, and to be fair, he didn't actually harm the children, but still... He kidnapped and transported them across state lines without parental consent. Andre was arrested and the children returned home unscathed. He was given 10 months in jail. Just 12 days after he was released, Andre was on the prowl again. On August 14, 1983, Tiahis Jackson disappeared on a short errand to the supermarket. Police investigated, and wouldn't you know it, Andre Rand was a suspect. He had a campsite at a cemetery creepy, just a half mile from where Tia Heese lived, and Tia Heese's mother had reported seeing a man fitting his description lurking around the parking lot. Andre was questioned, but charges were not filed. 11-year-old Tia Heese was never found. So this trend of people going missing and being last seen with Andre Rand continued for several years, most notably with the disappearance of Hank Gaffario and Ethel Atwell. As usual, Andre is taken in for questioning, but there's not enough evidence to connect him to the crime, and he walks free. However, after years of frustration, the police finally catch a break. On July 9th, 1987, 12-year-old Jennifer Schweiger went for a short walk around her neighborhood. She had Down syndrome, and when she felt restless, her mother would instruct her to take a walk. On this particular day, though, she did not return. Her parents called the police and an investigation and search quickly ramped up. Two eyewitnesses reported seeing Jennifer walking around with a middle-aged man in her last known moments. Others reported seeing Andre's car circling the block that Jennifer was walking on. Andre was taken in for questioning, but authorities didn't have enough evidence to reach conclusions, so he was released. It wasn't until the 35th day of the search that a volunteer noticed an unusual clumping of dirt and clay. He began digging under that spot and discovered a little foot and then Jennifer's entire body. Her body was buried just 150 yards from a campsite that belonged to Andre Rand. Even worse, her body was found on the grounds of Willowbrook State School. Finally, authorities had enough evidence and arrested Rand. He was charged with kidnapping and first-degree murder. The jury couldn't reach a verdict on the murder charge, but convicted Rand of kidnapping sentencing him to 25 years to life in prison. Finally, 18 years after his reign of terror began, Andre Rand faced significant jail time, and the families of the victims received some sort of closure and a sense of justice. Andre Rand is still in jail. In 2004, investigators had enough evidence to bring charges on Rand for Holly Ann Hughes' disappearance as a new witness came forward. Investigators pieced together that Andre had offered Holly candy, pulled her into his car, and drove away. Rand was found guilty of kidnapping, 
and given 25 years to life. Currently, he's serving time at the Great Meadows Correctional Facility and won't become eligible for parole until he's 93 years old. So that's the story of Andre Rand, the man that showed us that often reality can be worse than imagination. More than half a century after his first crime, much is still unknown about him as he operated in the shadows, darting around tunnels and graveyards, preying on the most vulnerable. Still, one thing is certain. He has ensured that the legend of Cropsy will live on and on. That's 10 Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe. I'm the host, and I really appreciate you listening. If this is your first time tuning in to 10 Minute Murder, I said tuning in like like this is a radio. If this is your first time checking out 10 Minute Murder, please subscribe now so that you can catch up on all the back episodes and never miss any of the new ones. Connect with me on social media too. You'll see the visuals that go along with what we're talking about here in the podcast. If you like this episode, there's a place you can rate and review on Apple, Spotify, and so many of the other places. Uh, Please do that. Your positive feedback is appreciated and it helps this show grow. So Joe, how was your day today? I appreciate you asking, and I'd love to tell you. Uh, I had an exciting day. I slipped down in the Target parking lot. Zero out of ten. Would not recommend. And you know how when you fall down, you officially know how old you are because the people, if you fall down and people laugh, you're cool. Everything's good. When you fall down and people look concerned, that means you've gotten old. Um, It was a mix of the two when I fell today in the parking lot. So that tracks. All right, quickly. Uh, This email today comes from Robert in Tallahassee. Hi, Joe. Great podcast. I'm curious. Your audio always sounds so good, unlike many other true crime shows I listen to. Not Robert throwing shade. Uh, What kind of microphone do you use? Uh, Robert, it is a Sennheiser MKH416. And if you don't know anything about microphones, that means nothing to you. That's like another language. But uh, just know that it looks like I'm talking into a giant magic marker. When I first started this podcast, I bought the the one that all podcasters seem to use, that Shure SM7B. And I've had this one that I'm using now for years and years and years from doing voiceovers. Uh, but I bought the one that looks like a podcast microphone because I thought, hey, this will make my voice sound more podcasty. I used it on a couple of episodes and I didn't like it. So I sold it and I went back to the microphone that I've been using for a very long time. Okie dokie, that's going to do it for this episode today. I'm so glad that you chose to spend a few minutes of time listening to this podcast. It means the world to me. Thank you for listening to 10 Minute Murder.